I've been a real estate broker in Chicago for almost two decades. My career began at a small independent brokerage, where in my first week, the broker and owner entrusted me with a lead. He was elderly and in poor health, so he often passed his leads to agents. One such lead came from a friend of his who had passed away, and the friend's son wanted to sell the house. I contacted the son, who shared stories of his long-standing relationship with the broker and their families. He seemed genuine and kind. After inspecting the house, I meticulously prepared a comparative market analysis, had other brokers review my numbers, and rehearsed my presentation. I ensured all materials were professionally printed and prepared for potential questions and objections. During my presentation, the son was impressed, agreeing with a list price of $135,000 and the commission. He requested a two-month delay to clean out the house and allowed his siblings to go through their father's belongings before repainting. While I knew how to address this request, I mistakenly agreed to call back in two months, trusting his sincerity due to his close relationship with my broker. However, my trust was misplaced. Three days later, I drove past the house and saw a for sale by owner sign in the yard. I realized then that I had been deceived and used. Despite feeling betrayed, I didn't contact him again. Nowadays, I would have secured the listing before he had the chance to sell it himself. About five to six weeks later, my broker was at City Hall paying for transfer stamps when he noticed in the registry that the son had recently paid for transfer stamps as well. This indicated that the house had been sold, confirming my suspicions. Experience has taught me valuable lessons in this industry. I pretended to be unaware and quickly launched into the conversation. I spoke rapidly, aiming to relay everything before he could interject, and asked if he had cleaned out and repainted the house because a relocation company had contacted me about a doctor looking to move to the area. I mentioned his house to the doctor, highlighting its proximity to the hospital and its appealing qualities. The doctor was so interested that he made an offer of $215,000, sight unseen, considering it a great deal compared to New York City prices. I didn't recall the exact figure I had previously mentioned to Austin, but went ahead with the offer. Austin, furious, exclaimed that I had previously told him the house was worth $135,000. I retorted that since we hadn't listed it yet, the higher offer was a win. Austin revealed that he had already sold the house for $130,000, based on my earlier estimate. I expressed surprise at the sale, but maintained that my estimate had been accurate. Austin demanded $80,000, to which I responded that I would find something else for my buyer. Perplexed, I asked where he was going with this. You sold your house for a price he was satisfied with. It just so happened that I found an out-of-town buyer who was willing to pay more. You got fair market value, so you did well. As for the $80,000, that's not going to happen. I've never encountered a situation like this before, but if you can reverse the sale, I can speak with my buyer to see if he would be willing to wait for you to close again. I'm not sure if that's possible. Regarding the $80,000, I won't be paying it. I can hire a professional appraiser to demonstrate that you receive fair market value for the house. My mistake was misquoting the price to my buyer, not to you. You can expect to hear from my attorney. That's fine. I need to end our conversation now, Robert. I have to visit your old house to see if the new owners would be willing to provide me with a copy of their appraisal and discuss the possibility of selling it for a quick profit. Do you know if they've moved in already? And that's when he slammed the phone down. I would never handle a situation like this the same way now, even though dealing with people who waste my time is part of the job. Getting upset doesn't make it better. However, I still think about that call today. While part of me feels like a jerk, I still get a little smile thinking about him regretting trying to take advantage of me. To generate more business, I offer assistance in finding tax comparable for people seeking tax reductions from the county. I once met the new owners of the house I mentioned earlier and offered to help them dispute their taxes at no cost. They turned out to be a delightful couple who eventually used my services to sell that house eight years later. Just before the market crash, they had made significant improvements to the house, pricing it competitively. They ended up selling it for $345,000 in a back-to-back -back closing. 
Unfortunately, the house they were buying burned down, but they still managed to sell their house and moved in with relatives while searching for a new home. Two months later, while living with the wife's grandparents, the market crashed. They stayed there for two more years before I helped them purchase a large 4,000 square foot foreclosure for $130,000. It was new construction that only needed some finishing touches like trim, a garage, light fixtures, and a kitchen, which they were happy to install themselves given the price and location. Today, that property is worth approximately $550,000. As the area has seen significant growth, they have been very satisfied with my services and have referred me to others. As a side note, I informed them about the situation with Austin, and they willingly provided me with a copy of their appraisal in case he decided to take legal action. They mentioned he was difficult to deal with and had a major disagreement with his siblings at the closing, insisting he should receive an additional $20,000 because he had managed the sale, which is what a realtor would have charged. Since his dad was close with my broker, we were only charging him 4.5%, which amounted to $5,850 on a $130,000 sale. Did he ever call a lawyer? Yes, about a year later, he called the only lawyer he knew, my broker's brother. The brother spoke with my broker, who then spoke with me. I provided them with the market analysis and the appraisal, and we never heard anything more about it. I used to work at a small local spa company with only about six employees. I was there for a year and a half and only met the owner once, but I spoke with her on the phone frequently. She was eccentric, but that's beside the point. I was hired because my friend's mom, Julian, was the manager and they needed someone quickly after someone quit in the middle of their shift. I excelled at the job and learned quickly. I became so proficient that a few months in, they had me train new hires. Despite the high turnover rate, I never received a raise. It wasn't a big deal, but it would have been nice. I was always the one closing up the spa, which involved tasks like vacuuming and dusting. As time passed, Julian started nitpicking things. A string left on the rug, the candy bowls not being fully filled even though they were barely touched small things that were blown out of proportion. Things progressively got worse with me being accused of not cleaning rooms that I knew I had cleaned. While I admit I occasionally forgot something, I was being reprimanded for things I knew I had done. I had another issue at work where my coworker would forget the exact same things as me, but instead of being yelled at, she would just be reminded to try and remember. Julian eventually convinced other coworkers to lie so she could report me to the owner. Many days, I would come straight from school wearing jeans. Since Julian left right when I arrived, I would clock in, count the drawer, and then change into my work pants. However, co-workers would lie and tell her that I never changed. To combat this, I started taking pictures and timestamping them. This worked for a while, but then my co-workers began saying that I changed back into jeans after the pictures. Additionally, Julian would often claim that I didn't clean well enough. Despite all these complaints being submitted to the owner, I wasn't fired because they were desperate for employees and no one else wanted to work there. Eventually, I quit because I found a summer job that offered more hours and paid significantly better. In just seven weeks at my new job, I made the same amount of money that I made in a year at the spa. Shortly after I left, I discovered why Julian wanted me gone so badly. She hired her son, who happened to be my ex-friend, because he was too lazy to work at a job where he couldn't sit around all day. This made me angry, but what made it worse was that they refused to give me my last payment. We were paid in cash, so I sent multiple emails and text messages to Julian and the owner, reminding them that I needed my payment. When they ignored me, I threatened legal action. Being a high schooler, I don't think they believed I would follow through. However, I was determined. There were many reasons I was upset about this so I decided to document everything about that place. I experienced several concerning issues at my previous job, including working eight plus hour shifts without breaks or lunch, which are required by state law, as well as other serious problems. These included rats in the basement, an ant infestation, the use of fake security cameras, allowing underage drinking, 
and Julian falsifying the amount of money paid to her son and daughter for under-the-table work. There were instances of child labor, as Julian's daughter was not old enough to work legally. Furthermore, the company neglected to address important maintenance issues, such as building framework and mild, and the temperature inside the building often exceeded or fell below legal limits, reaching above 100 degrees or below 50 degrees Fahrenheit on bad days. Julian also gave herself a raise despite already earning more than everyone else. The company sold client information, failed to pay workers on some occasions due to insufficient funds in the drawer, and the owner and Julian were too lazy to go to the bank to remedy the situation. Prior to leaving, I recorded instances of verbal abuse from Julian and even obtained admissions of false write-ups against me. Although I can't recall all the details, I compiled this information and reported it in an email, which led to investigations. Ultimately, both Julian and the owner were fined heavily, and Julian is currently facing jail time for fraud. The business was forced to shut down and be sold, though I am unsure if the owner is also facing jail time. Additionally, I reached out to every spa within the 50-mile radius, resulting in the owner, Julian, and some co-workers being blacklisted from working within an hour's drive of our location. Despite not receiving my last payment, the outcome of exposing these issues was far more rewarding than pursuing legal action. I was working at a gas station, getting paid cash under the table, and doing side gigs to pay my own way through school. My co-worker, whom we'll call Adam, was also a student, but his parents were footing the bill, so he wasn't as busy or desperate as I was just working for rent and beer money. Adam had the graveyard shift from 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. While I worked the shift before, from 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. We didn't have a time clock, and we only got paid for the shifts we were scheduled for. However, Adam started coming late, usually just five or 10 minutes, but it bothered me because I wasn't getting paid for that time, yet he was. One night, when I called his house at 12.10, and his roommate said he was still playing video games, I had enough. He lived about 15 minutes away, so he was already half an hour late for his shift. When he finally walked in, I confronted him, feeling fed up with his behavior. He tried to act reasonable, with wide eyes and raised hands, and told me to let him know on payday what he owed me. Instead of going to the gas station owner, I came up with a better plan. I started keeping track of every minute he was late, whether it was 5 minutes here, 10 minutes there, or even 15 or 20 minutes. Weeks went by, and I'm sure he thought he had gotten away with it. I had been lenient, telling him not to rush and to take his time getting in. However, the week before finals, I'd walked into the store while he was covering a day shift for someone else, pulled the schedule off the wall, and handed it to him. Which two shifts do you want to take? I asked. He looked puzzled at first, then realized what I meant. He rolled his eyes, reached for his wallet, but I stopped him. No, leave your wallet. I don't want your money. I want your time. I handed him the graph where I had meticulously recorded every minute. He had been late. You owe me 16 hours, two shifts. Pick them. He protested, dude, it's the week before finals. I replied that I didn't get to pick which nights he came in late, so he didn't get to pick the week he paid me back.